would like to introduce to BBI and to those that are taking classes during uh, by correspondence. This is our Romans class. We're privileged tonight to have Brother James Baidu with us, our missionary from Ghana, West Africa, a great man of God. The Lord's using him miraculously there. I'm going to give him a, just a few minutes to share just a little bit about his work tonight. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good evening to you all. Um, yes, I was a Muslim. I was born a Muslim. But uh, by the grace of God, I got saved. Amen. In 1985. I'm a trained accountant. I've worked with money for years. But uh, when God called me to ministry, I got saved. I decided to preach the word of God. And um, I had training for some time. Went back to Ghana in 1995. Started Atomic Hills Baptist Church. Uh, it's doing well. For the past 20 years, I've been in ministry. We've seen thousands coming to Christ. Uh, we come here from time to time, share the word of God with people, share our ministry, and try to encourage people to come and be partners so that we can win souls for Christ in Africa. My wife and I got here last two weeks. Uh, God willing, we'll go back by three months' time. But uh, we are part of Bethel Baptist Church Mission Board. So we are staying right here. So you see it from time to time. Right. And I will share with you what the Lord is doing there. But God is still in the saving business. Amen. Yes, we see people saved every week by the grace of God. I'm glad the Lord has changed my direction. Uh, I thought I would be a businessman, but God said no. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Amen. 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 I want to encourage you pastors, uh, if you would like to have Brother Baidu to come to your church, uh, he's available, and uh, we'll be talking to some of you maybe after service. And those of you on the internet, if you would like to talk to me personally about that, get in contact with me, and that'll be a great blessing. He would be a great asset to your mission program. Amen. And I do appreciate Brother James Baden. He has a youth camp every August. And anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 young people come. And hundreds of them get saved by the grace of God. And I thank God for that. I mean, doing a great work there in God. All right, let's take our Bible tonight. Open it up to Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. I hope you have your study guide. And we're going to quickly tonight go through chapter number 3. Uh, Lord willing. And uh, Paul actually is continuing uh, his firm conclusion about the sinfulness of man in chapter number 3. But he also begins to speak to us about the way of salvation. It's getting exciting in chapter number 3. I love chapter 3. By the way, we remember back in chapter 2, we found profession without practice is profitless. Right. It's not going to profit you any uh, if you, you have a, a, a profession without practice. And uh, by the way, I don't believe in work salvation. Wow. But I believe after salvation there will be a change in you that will bring about some works yeah. for the Lord. It will bring about fruit for God. Many people are seated in churches, and I don't want to run any rabbits tonight because we've got a lot of a hoeing to do tonight, but uh, if there's a rabbit pops out, I'm going to run it. But there's a lot of people, I think, seated in churches in our country that have never been saved. And they're going on baptism, they're going on a, a feel good, they're going, they've never really been born again. By the way, the Bible says you must be born again. Amen? If you're going to go to heaven, you must be born again. So Paul continues that thought with the opening of chapter number 3. Let's jump right in. How about that? Romans chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, What advantage hath then the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? And I wish I had time tonight to go into uh, the details of circumcision. Circumcision is a cutting. It is a symbol. It is a blood symbol. And it's a very important thing. God, uh, by the way, circumcision is, is more than just something the Jews do. It is a symbol. And it is very important to the Jew. And the Old Testament. 
But Paul was a Jew, amen? And he says this, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is their circumcision? So what Paul is asking is a very important question. What is the benefit of being born a Jew? Well, if being born a Jew is not enough, it's, it's actually not enough to automatically take you to heaven, what benefit is there then in being a Jew? Well, we have learned from chapter 2, religion is not enough to take anyone to heaven. And we've learned that already. But Paul is talking here, and, he, and I could ask it this way, uh, we could say this, what is the benefit of being born in a Christian home? And then there's very little difference. I mean, if you think about it comparatively. Notice what he says in verse number 2. Paul says, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And I want to say to you, think about that tonight. Who kept up with the Scripture? The Old Testament. Who, who was in charge of that? The Jews were in charge of it. The Jews had a national advantage over the Gentiles. Yes. Back then, they sure did. Uh, and by the way, I think that question should say... Uh, let me see, where is it at? Number two. Uh, number two. The blank has a national... Okay, well, I guess that's all right. Uh, there was one question on there. I thought that it needed to be reworded, but never mind. We won't worry about that. But the Jews had a national advantage over the Gentiles. The reason for their national advantage was that to the Jews were committed the oracles of God. Think with me for just a moment. They had, number one, a comprehension of God. Think about that tonight. They were not ignorant, but they had enlightenment. Now, could you imagine being a Gentile and not having a God to speak through the prophets? Amen. They had prophets, but they were false prophets. Amen. The prophets of Baal. But there again, to the Jews, the Jews had the true prophets of God. God spoke through the Jewish people, and God called them up. But they were not ignorant. They had enlightenment. They had a comprehension of God. They had the oracles of God, and the oracles of God are His Word. And Stephen spoke of them in Acts chapter 7 and verse 37, 38, and 9. He says this, This is that which said the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, and ye shall hear him. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. So unto the Jews were given the word of God, the oracles of the Lord. Stephen goes on to say in chapter 7 of Acts, verse number 40, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. So what did Paul say there in chapter 3, verse 2? He said, Much every way, chiefly, that unto them were committed the oracles. They had the Word of God. And can I tell you tonight, we should thank God for that. Some of you were brought up in a Christian home, and you had the Word of God. I had a drug problem when I was a child. I was drugged by the ear every Sunday to church, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. Every revival meeting, vacation Bible school, I did not have a choice. If I was at home, I was going. Amen? I tried to get sick. I still had to go. Unless I was on the bed, amen, and very ill with a fever, I had to go to church. But they had a comprehension of God. But secondly, not only they had a comprehension, but think with me for just a moment. They had communication with God. Aren't you thankful for that? They, they, they had been given the words of His commands and then how to approach the throne of God. They had a priest and, a, and the, the priestly order was all set up in the, in the book and it was given by the law how they were to approach God. And by the way, let me just say this. We need to think about our approach unto God too. The Bible says we regard iniquity in our heart. He'll not hear us. You see, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an intercessor. But I believe with all of my heart that we need to be clean and cleansed before we come into the presence of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, He is the high priest. And brother, I want to tell you, you just don't walk up to God with unconfessed sin in your life and get your prayers answered. 
Right. By the way, if you do have sin in your life and you pray, you're wasting your time. Right. Amen. Amen. But they had communication with God. But not only that, but brother uh, Al, uh, Arvel, they had they had a, the covenant relationship with God. Think about that. Uh, the God of heaven had chosen them to be His people. So there was a great advantage of being born a Jew or in our day, being born in a Christian yeah. home. Oh yes, it's a great advantage. Thank God for that. Brother James Bailey was, was not born in a Christian home. Is that right? Your parents were Muslim. Yes, sir. So think about that. Think about what he was trained and taught as a child. I'd love to sit down and talk to him sometime about that. But how many of you were raised literally in a Christian home? How many of you? Raise your hand real high. How many of you were not? One. One. Two. Okay, and one that has a dad that got saved later in her life. Uh, he, was, he got saved before I was born. Okay, all right. So, 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 we have the majority of people here tonight. We're blessed, yeah. mm -hmm. and see, we we take that for granted. We we do know there's a great benefit in being born into a Christian home. Yeah, same Boy, I'm thankful for that. So there is an advantage. Oh my, yes! And what a great advantage it is. A person born within a nation or even more so within a family that has God's Word has every advantage in coming to God and living for God. Would you agree? Right. In fact, such a person could have no greater privilege. Man. Did you know it's a privilege that you have had? Right. And oftentimes we take for granted the church, you should thank God for the church. Amen. If you didn't have one and you didn't have a place that you could come and worship, you'd be thankful if you come into a place like this or the place where you go. Your church. You are to thank God for that. So we, we know that one, listen carefully, one born with such privileges so great as we have, actually, Brother Boris, are without excuse if they fail to trust the Lord in salvation and live for Him. Amen. You're not going to stand before God. I want to tell you the people in Wilkes County, can I say this? We did an outreach last week right here in this community. And I took note. And I'm willing to stand here tonight and tell you that probably 60% of the people that we talked to last week are not in church anywhere. Right, right here right. in our community. 60%. Now, we don't have room for the whole community here in this church. And I'm going to be honest with you. I hope every church in Wilkes County gets on fire for God because we have a great opportunity. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Amen. We need to pray for drunkards in the community. There was a young man, and Brother Tony called his name, and this is a rabbit, and I'm going to run it because it's my rabbit. I knocked on his door, and he came out. He's probably 35 years old. told me he had a daughter and a wife. And he said, Preacher, he said, my dad is a pastor. And he said, I am a drunkard. I'm an alcoholic. And it was in the morning time when I knocked on his door. And he looked 35 years old and he looked to be 75. Because he looked that bad. His health because of the alcohol. And you know what? I hate alcohol and what it does to people. And I began to talk to him. And, and he told me, he said, Preacher, he said, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I've never been saved. But I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. But Pastor, I want to tell you, I cannot come to the house of God with liquor on my breath. And he told me, he said, Preacher, he said, I want you to look at me. And his hand was like this. He said, I haven't had a drink yet this morning. And when we get done talking, I've got to go back in and I've got to have another drink right here within a mile of the church that I pastor. And I've drove by his house countless times over the last years that I've been pastor here. And I've never been able to stop because I've been too consumed with something else on my mind. God forgive me. I've had to repent this week yeah. for being a lax in pastoring and being a lax in the burden that I have for the community that we live in. We need revival. America needs revival. Brooks County needs revival. There's lost people that need to be saved by the grace of God right here in our own community. I challenge you as a saved, born again child of God to get excited over reaching the lost. You you say, preacher, I'm scared to knock on doors. Get over it and go knock on doors. Right. We had a young lady that had an injury last week. I don't know what was wrong with her leg. 
And I made fun of her because she walked like this. <laughs> but you know, she was out knocking on doors. Yeah. I think she went two solid days and had a doctor's appointment the last day. I thank God for that. We need to get it busy yeah. for the Lord. Amen. We're without excuse. I got to move on. Look in verse number three. The Bible says, For well, what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Let me just say this. You unbelieving people, you don't change the truth of this book. All right. Amen. I want to tell you, unbelievers don't change the Word of God. The truth does not, is not affected by whether you and I believe or not. Amen. And I want to tell you, just we just need to get a hold of that. If I say I don't believe, there's a wall right over there. I still don't believe that wall's there. <laughs> now whose fault is that? And after a while it'd get kind of monotonous. <laughs> after a while it probably hurt. After a while somebody say, you're a fool. And that's exactly the truth. Yes. You can look around and see the creation. Yes. And see all the life coming up. And the grass, it's going to need to be mowed pretty soon, Brother Bay, do. Yes, Amen? And not... And, and people still say there is no God. Let me just say this. I can look at that wall and say there's no wall there, but it does not change the truth. There's a wall there. Can I tell you, I can look at this book and say I do not believe, but it does not negate the fact that this is the truth of the Word of God. I want to tell you, I can say there is no hell, but there is a literal burning hell. I mean, I, I could say there could not have been a virgin birth. I could say there is no life after death. When you're dead, you're dead. And by the way, there was a man that was buried just a week or so ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, that just believed when you're dead, you're dead, and now he is dead. And he knows now that there is life after death. I want you to understand this evening, this book, and a lot of people think it should not be taken literally. Let me tell you, friend, when it's talking literal, you need to take it literal unless it specifies and you yeah. rightly divide it to take it spiritual. I'm telling you, there is a literal burning hell tonight where lost people go. And it's an awful place. Right. Whether you believe it or don't, it does not change the fact of it. A lot of people say there, will no, there is no flood, so there will be no fire. There will be no fire. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You hang around. It's coming. Amen. You may not believe it, but that does not change the fact of what the Lord says in His Word. Somebody say amen. 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 Because that's the truth. Look in verse number 4. Paul said, God forbid. I like this verse. Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. You see, Paul here is making one of the greatest statements, I believe, in all the Bible. He said, let God be true, but every man a liar. It has a twofold meaning tonight. It means that those outside the church who deny there is a God and all this book says are liars. It also means that those who would dare stand in pulpits or before classes to teach and deny what this book says is absolute truth is a lie. Let me just say this. I've got probably two, three thousand books upstairs in my library in my office. And you know what? I'm just going to go weeding them. And some of them, if they deny the truth of the Word of God, I will toss it in the trash. By the way, there's a lot of books out there that deny the truth of the Word of God. They deny that this Bible is God's Word. And I want to tell you, I don't need that kind of book in my library. Amen? It's just sitting there taking up dead space because it's a dead book as far as I'm concerned. You say, well, you can glean out of it. Well, why would you want to glean something that's not from the right source? Amen. It's half rotten. I like that, Brother Morris. Bless your heart. Amen. I thought you was asleep back then. <laughs> Verse number five. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God, un is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Paul said, I speak as a man. Paul asked a powerful and pointed question here. Is God unrighteous when he takes vengeance for the unrighteous acts of men? Is he? 
Is God wrong in judging? Wicked and sinful man. The answer is found in verse number 6. Notice what he said. Paul said, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Let me tell you something, buddy. God is going to judge this world. Had a man tell me one time, he said, I don't believe that my God would send anybody to hell. He said, my God is a God of love. And He loves everybody. And I thought to myself, who told you that? Certainly God is a God of love. And He is a God that loves everybody. He lo in fact, He loves everybody. Boy, I wish I had another opportunity. You ever had somebody years ago when you were just scared to say anything? It was back before I was preaching. And this guy, he ran all over me. I'd give anything, amen. I'd give my watch to have one more opportunity to preach the Word of God to him. Amen. I don't even know where he's at right now. But I'd like to tell him a thing or two because I've learned a couple of things since then. Amen. I want to tell you my God is a God of love and He does love us enough that He gave His only begotten Son and He came to this world and He literally took our place on the cross of Calvary and He shed His precious blood to save our unrighteous soul. But let me tell you something, friend. That same God is a God who's holy and righteous and just us and will not allow sin to remain in His presence. Amen. I'm going to tell you, He right. will judge this world and He will judge sinners. The Bible says that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. Right. But the Bible also says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, Brother Kent. Right. They're going to. Right. There's coming a judgment day. Right. God's going to judge the world. God, in His, God is right in His judgment of this world in sin. Amen. He's right to do it. And there are those who claim that God will not judge men for their sin, but boy, I believe that's wrong, don't you? Verse number 7, verse number 8. Got to hurry tonight. The Bible says, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto His glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather as we be slanderously reported as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. Paul had been accused of slander. You see, somebody had heard him preach and they misinterpreted what Paul had said. And by the way, that never happens today. <laughs> say amen right there, Sister Megan. Never happens today. Uh, Paul had been slain. Paul had been wrongly accused of teaching falsely. And note what the verse says in verse 8. The Bible says he was accused of, let us do evil that good may come. You see, Paul was a preacher of the grace of God. And think about it. Look at that. Have you ever seen? I have never noticed that verse and looked at it and studied it until I was studying to teach this lesson. And uh, you'll have to, Lord, have to forgive me for that. But Paul got slandered right here. And some had told that Paul was teaching that the more we sin, the more God's grace was given to cover it. And if that be the case, Paul said, uh, let us do evil that good may come. Paul was hated for preaching pure grace. And by the way, if you preach pure grace, you're going to be hated too. People just don't like that. They think there's got to be some works intermingled in that thing. But I want to tell you, Paul preached pure grace. He did. And again, I say that Paul and James are not contrary to each other. I think they complement each other. Amen. I believe in a salvation that works, not works salvation. Paul preached pure grace. Thank God for salvation. You and I, we can't do anything to obtain our salvation. And Paul taught that. And he preached it, brother. He preached the simple message of the good grace of God. And let me tell you something, buddy. It'll get the job done today, Brother Baidu. It'll still convert old sinners by the grace of Almighty God. And by the way, it's the only way to get saved. Right. Hey, Amen, it is. But he was accused. Paul preached. Grace was greater than all our sins. Aren't you glad for that grace? Paul preached that where sin abounded, grace did superabound. He said that in Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, 
Grace did much more about. I'm thankful for that. And those people took that and they twisted it around and they scandalized Paul and they talked about him. And Paul also preached the sufficiency of God's grace. You remember old Paul had a thorn in the flesh and he went to God three different times and he said, Lord, I want you to remove it. Amen. That must have been three dickens he was talking about. <laughs> Can we edit that out, please? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thorn in the flesh. And he preached and he prayed and he asked the Lord. And the message came to Paul. And he said, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, that it might depart from me. And then he said, He got this message. And he said unto me, This is the Lord Jesus talking to him. He he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Oh, yes, and then Paul said, Oh, hallelujah, most gladly, therefore, I'm about to get happy tonight. Will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? I'm telling you, that's what we need in this day and hour. We need the power of Almighty God to rest upon the pulpits, to rest upon the preachers, to rest upon the church, and move in a mighty way. We need the power of Almighty God more than we need anything else. Yeah. Without Him, we can do nothing. Yeah. These Judaizers slandered Paul by telling the people that Paul was teaching. The more a man sinned, the more grace God bestowed, and because of it, more glory came to God through the sinning of a person. How foolish. Yeah. How foolish. Paul taught that not at all. But he was scandalized. He was slandered over that very thing. He closed the verse with the statement, whose damnation is just. In other words, they'll get the reward coming to them. I hate to say it, but there's going to be many that's going to get the reward coming to them unless they get right with God. Notice verse number 9. We're doing good. i got 16 minutes. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Brother Kent, you reckon we'll make it? Absolutely. All right, thank you. Verse number 9, What then? Are we better than they? Well, were they? You think not? Paul said no. In no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and did Gentiles that they are all under sin. You see, tonight we need to understand that. What a question. What then? Are we better than they? Can I tell you tonight, listen to me carefully. You and I are not better. We're just born again. Amen. 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 I'm telling you, I am not better than that fellow just out the road that needs the Lord that's an alcoholic. And it's just only by the grace of God that I'm not in his shoes tonight. That could have been me. I'm, my father was an alcoholic. He was more than an alcoholic. My daddy was a drunkard. My uncles were drunkards. My youngest uncle died at 38 years old, fell off a bench backward and broke his neck, and he was drunk, completely intoxicated to the point that he didn't even know what killed him, my friends. Listen to me. Never made a profession of faith. Far as I know, went out lost and undone. I'm telling you, alcohol has destroyed many families. I'm telling you, I had the makings of it in my life as well. Are you listening? Man, but it's just by the good grace of God. Yeah. Thank God I am not better than that young man out the road. And in fact, I took him by the hand. And I said, son, I want to tell you, I come from a family. I know what alcohol does. And I know there's a God. Let me tell you about him tonight. That's able to deliver yeah. drunkards. He's able to deliver yeah. dope heads. We knocked on the door just the other day. And this beautiful young lady come out. At least she was looking beautiful to begin with. She had purple hair, kind of like Sister Haley has tonight. And uh, <laughs> you'll get that after one. Had purple hair. Her hair was blonde and it had purple in it. And if you got purple in your hair, I'm not saying nothing about that. But she smiled when they gave her the gospel track. And I, I, she didn't have hardly any teeth. And you could see what teeth she had. And it wasn't that she probably didn't brush them but that she was on drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful young lady to begin with. And then I looked and I saw 
I tell you, you go out there in the highways and the hedges, you're going to see some things. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Could be my daughter. Mm -hmm. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. That could be some of you. Could be Sister Courtney. Mm -hmm. Oh my, wouldn't that have been awful? Mm -hmm. To have knocked on that door and seen Courtney open the door and had purple in her hair. And she smiled and her teeth all rotted away. Could you imagine? Mm -hmm. You know what? The good grace of God made the difference in her life. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And it made the difference in your life as well because you're here tonight. Thank God. Oh, yes, are we better than they? Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? The truthful answer is no. In no wise. That means not at all. Look in verse 10, 11, and 12. As it is written, here we go. This is for all those people that think they're so good. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. I had a fellow tell me, he said, I've always loved God. Mm. Really? They are, verse 12, They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We think ourselves pretty good. But we find in these verses that Paul said, man, including women, boys and girls, <coughs> And men are totally depraved. And by the way, we're all in the same boat. Isn't that good tonight, though? Man. That we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Isn't it good tonight? Even though God called the Jews and made a covenant with them and to bring forth His Son, and they are His chosen people, yet God made a way for you and I who are not Jewish. Man. But the Bible says Jews and Gentiles alike are sinners. Right. So in that instance, we're all in the same boat and we just need to be saved. Before salvation, all men are hopelessly lost, dead in trespasses and sin, guilty and condemned. The wrath of God abides upon them at this very moment. Are you listening? The wrath of God abides. John chapter 3. If we know someone tonight, do you know anybody that thinks they're good enough to go to heaven? Yeah. <laughs> Who? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> if you know someone that thinks they're good enough, perhaps we should read verses 13 through 20 to them. Notice what verse 13 says. And boy, this is sobering. I was looking at this and I, this is kind of gross. How many of y'all like gross stuff? Half the girls in here waving their hands up. Notice what the Bible says in verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Let me just give you this. The throat is an open sepulcher. Let me paint you a picture. This is a terrible picture of an unregenerate heart. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34? He looked at those Jews and He said, O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye be evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So we know when the mouth speaks, the throat's going to be open. Jeremiah said the heart is what? Deceitful above all things. And desperate wicked who can know it let me just give you this an open sepulcher is a grave with an uncovered body huh yeah we went and eat Mexican the other day you like Mexican man I do too and uh, today I was getting me something to eat out of the refrigerator my wife had made a meatloaf Sunday. We went and eat Mexican some time ago. And uh, I pulled out this bowl and I looked in it and I could see through it. And it looked like a, a wrap. And I'm thinking, I'm not brave enough to open that right now. So I believe I just set that over in the counter. I got my meatloaf out and I made me a hero sandwich. Man, it was good. Mm. And uh, I forgot the Mexican on the bar. And it was almost time for the wifey 
And you know what happens when it's almost time for the wifey? You do the radar thing. You look and see what you've messed up during the day. You get the pillows back up off the floor, and the coffee cups gathered up, and everything's kind of... Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Wink at me, boys. You know what I'm talking about. And I looked over there on the bar, and there was uh, that Mexican. Oh, yeah. So I thought, well, here goes nothing. I should have went outside. I opened that up, and it was just like spirits just come out. And I'm thinking, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I'm telling you, I didn't know if I could gag or not. I didn't know what to do. I would have run if it had helped. It was terrible, the smell. Could you imagine a dead body in an open sepulcher? Do you know what dead bodies do? I'm not talking about embalmed bodies. I'm talking about a dead body. And after a few days, that thing's going to go to stinking. The smell is going to be horrific. And by the way, not only the smell, but how about the decay? How about the rot? How about the worm? and the maggots. And Paul said, their mouth is like an open sepulcher. Can I paint you a picture tonight? <laughs> you know that one woman in the church has got really bad breath? <laughs> you know which one I'm talking about? And she always... <laughs> She always want to come and talk to you. And she'll say, How are you today? <laughs> Woo! It's worse than that. I seen some spit going that way on that one. Could you imagine? Their mouth is an open sepulchre. <laughs> You got liberty tonight. The next time she comes up to you, just tell it. Your mouth is an open sepulcher. <laughs> Some people's off. Spiritually. Think about that. I got your attention now, hallelujah. <laughs> Now, let me give you something that will help you tonight. Can I do that? Verse 14. Notice what the Bible... Look at your Bible. <laughs> we have fun in Bible college. Amen. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. How foolish it is for a mouth to curse God. That's it. Yeah. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You say, well, preacher, I would never do that or associate with those that do. But I want to tell you, there's probably bunches of people in churches that take God's name in vain and don't even realize they're doing it. <coughs> Can I get in our little corner where we live tonight? Can I help you tonight? Will you listen? Are you pliable? Are you teachable? I make people mad when I say this. But do you know what a youth euphemism is? Do you know what that is? It's when we exchange a word thought to be offensive for a word thought milder or less offensive. I want to challenge you. Write these little euphemisms down. Go home and take your dictionary and look up the definition of them. I saw a preacher today who posted a post and said something like, Freaky? Look that up in your dictionary. It's not for a man of God to be saying. Write down the word gosh. Do you know what it means? 
It's an alternation of God. Golly. I heard beavers say golly, Wally. Golly, Gomer. You say, well, they didn't cuss back then. Yeah, they did. Look it up in your dictionary. It's an alteration of God. You say, preacher, I, I'm, 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 you're getting in, must be getting in somebody's row right now because gosh and golly is a common word. Christians shouldn't use it. G. And then G whiz. Let me give you this. G whiz come around about 1880 to 1885. Do you know what it's a euphemism of? Jesus. G is Jesus. And with the final syllable replaced by whiz. And you can look up whiz and see what it means. Dang means damn. Darn means to curse. Damn. Heck is a euphemism for hell. Heck far. How many times have we heard that? You know what it means? Well, you get what I mean. And when we use these words, we're actually second-hand cussing. See, we're really not saying the words, but it's exactly what it means. And you see, tonight, I want to tell you, that there are others that would really embarrass both of us tonight, but you look them up for yourself. And you ask God if it's okay for you to use second-hand cuss words. Cussing is just plain dumb. And I want to tell you a lot. I, I've even heard preachers say those secondhand cuss words. I've heard them say them from the pulpit. Brother Tony, my God is a holy God. Man. He said in His Word, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for God will not hold Him guiltless. And we take God's name. Gosh. Gosh dang. You ever heard anybody say that? Mm -hmm. What are they saying? Oh, yeah. Look it up for you. I'm not making this up. And I preached it in my pulpit. I'm not just preaching. Say amen right there. I preached it here and got about the same response. <laughs> but you say, preacher, I didn't know. And you know what a lot of them did. But you ask them tonight, ask our church, what about secondhand cussing? And they'll remember it because it got in their cornrow. Mm -hmm. Listen tonight. I want to help you. But if you didn't know, right now is a good time to say, God, I'm not going to do that no more. Because, Lord, that was your name I was saying. And your name's a holy name. Your name's a righteous name. Your name's a just name. And, Lord, I love you more than I... God, help my mouth. Lord, help me tonight to realize that yeah. cursing is something that Christians shouldn't do. Man. And by the way, cussing is just dumb, Brother Kent. And by the way, I'm sorry to say that I've used cuss words before. I know none of y'all ever have. But <laughs> back before I was saved, before I was right with God. Yeah. But you know what? At least when you steal, you get what you stole. But when you curse, you don't receive anything. It's just dumb. It's just dumb. The only thing that you're going to receive is judgment. So we better watch our lips. Cursing is a foolish action. In fact, it's cowardly as well as foolish. Have I made you mad tonight? Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Look at this, verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Abel was slain by his brother Cain. Anger, uncontrolled, brings blood and often death. Verse 16, 17, and 18. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the peace and the way of peace they have not known. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Can I quote a preacher for you tonight? He, was very, he is a very well-known preacher. He said this. Let me make a statement that needs to be made from every pulpit in America at least one time every Sunday. But all of you better write this down because this is what he said. He said, there is no such thing as true repentance apart from godly fear. 
A person will not truly repent of sin until he truly fears God. And one of the reasons for the predicament we are in today as a nation is that preachers have outlawed preaching that creates a fear of God. Amen. Yeah, right. that? He goes on to say the average parishioner in the pew on Sunday mornings wants the preacher in the pulpit to prophesy smooth things. He does not want to be disturbed and he does not want to hear a message on a blazing, burning hell and neither does he want to be told that God is a consuming fire. He wants to, he wants to the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man and everybody is good and nobody is bad. Do you know who said that? Do you know who said that? It wasn't Blakey. No. <laughs> it was a gentleman named Oliver B. Green. And he said those words over 50 years ago. Copyright on the book is 1962. That's where we're at. You know what? We have forgot to preach the fear of God. I want to tell you something. There is no fear of God before their eyes and there is no fear of God today in our country. Look at the foolish things that's going on. People blatantly come into church and they'll break into a church. They'll come in the parking lot. Spend donuts in the parking lot of the house of God. There's no fear of God. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd be afraid God would strike me dead. In fact, if He'd start striking them dead, and you know what? I'm glad that I'm not God because I'd do it. I'd go... Pssst. They come in that part... Pssst. Buddy, I'd do it. Aren't you glad I ain't God? Because you may be pulling in there just a little bit too fast. You may squeal a tire and I might go, Pssst. <laughs> Deanna. <laughs> I see how y'all drive. <laughs> Verse 19, real quick. Now we know what things soever the law saith, saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law is a mouth shut, but it's not a heart opener. The law brings guilt and conviction. The law reveals us for what we really are, and that is sinners. In verse number 20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now let me just say this. The law has never saved the first person. Are you listening? Amen. The law did not save you. The Lord did. Amen. There's a great difference. But let me just say, you'll not be saved by your works. Now, Paul begins to introduce righteousness in verse 21. He says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But the, this righteousness of God is without the law. In other words, righteousness cannot be obtained by you and I keeping the law. The righteousness of God is witnessed by the law and the prophets. And we find this in the Scripture. Jesus said, Think not I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Fulfill. That's what the Lord said. Verse number 22, I'm almost done. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Aren't you glad there's no difference? Amen. Listen tonight. What if it was, I was, in, I was in New York City, Brother James, a few years ago, and I was giving out gospel tracts, my daughter and I, and this black guy come up to me, and he said, you know what, you're going to hell. He said, because you're white. Brother James, come up here a minute, would you? This is the flip side of everything. Look at that. This is my friend. He's my brother. You know what? We look just like each other. <laughs> if you could see inside of us, you know what you'd see? Christ. Jesus didn't shed His skin. Shed His blood. And some of us need to understand that Jesus was not pale white. Probably. I don't know what color he was.
was, but he was probably darker than I. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was as dark as Brother James. But aren't you glad that there's no difference in nationality Amen. or color of skin? Aren't you glad tonight that there's, there's no difference in great or small, rich or poor? Aren't you glad tonight there's no difference in just... What wouldn't it be good if just us males could go to heaven? Yeah. <laughs> Brother, you need to leave right now. <laughs> Aren't you glad, thank God, that women can go too? Amen. God could have said, you know, it's just the men. Or God could have said, well, you know, it's just the women because the women was deceived and the man willfully sinned. Are you listening? That's it. Right, right. God said, no, all of you can come. Amen. Whosoever will can come. Amen. Somebody, I wrote down, say glory right here. Glory. 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 Say a, a, a Ghana glory. Glory. Thank you. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. The Bible says, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The key word in verse number 23 is the word all. Oh. All. All. Means me, means you, all humanity. We all need a Savior for all of sin. All is an inclusive, definite, and convicting word. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All. We, I love that verse. That'll preach, Brother Arnold. Yep. It starts off with all and ends with all. Uh -huh. You can preach an all message. Amen. You can preach all night on that. Amen. You'll get that after a while. I may preach all of that after a while. Amen. You're hoping I'm going to get done. Amen. All we like have gone, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us. Oh. That means everyone. See, we've all gone astray. We've turned our own way. But for us, God sent Jesus to pay. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is free to men. Mm -hmm. Verse number 25, who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Let me just tell you, Jesus is the propitiation Amen. for our sins. Yes. That means the atonement, the atoning sacrifice that was offered to God that appeased the wrath of God and renders God happy with you and I. Right. We didn't deserve it. Right. Jesus paid it all. Yes. Aren't you glad you're saved? Yes. Oh yes. Verse 26, I declare and I say at this time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. It's a declared victory. Christ paid our sin debt, took our place, and He triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. Somebody shout. Yeah, Verse number 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by faith. Who can boast? There's not one of us. Verse 28, 29, and 30, and 31, and I'm through. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by, by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes! Of the Gentiles also. Amen. Seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Mm -hmm. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Mm -hmm. So is the law done away with after we're no. saved? No. no. The law is the standard. The law is the measurement. And we measure ourselves against it. We come up short. But there was one man who fulfilled the law and his name was Jesus. And that's the reason we're saved tonight. And the only reason. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, God, for this good lesson in chapter 3. Lord, we thank You for the fun we've had tonight. And, and Lord, the enlightenment from Your Word. And Lord, we're so glad tonight, Lord, to be saved. Lord, help us not to hide it. Help us to share everywhere we go. We thank you now for what you're going to do. Bless these students. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 May the Lord bless you.